Welcome to everyone. My name is Damian Shield. I'm the Senior Director at the Center for Medical Simulation. I'm responsible for faculty development and instructor training, a program that we've been doing in Boston, across the U.S. and internationally. And um, <clears throat> it's my pleasure to welcome you all and Walter Epic, uh, who is, a, I consider a friend, uh, very honored that he's agreed to join and uh, help all of us learn today. I uh, frequently, when I introduce folks, I start with what a privilege it is to, to do so, and, and it is to, to work here at CMS and to work with folks like Walter. And uh, we started this weekly webinar session with the idea of connecting and learning across our international community during socially distant and uncertain times. And of course, I uh, recognize that in Chicago, for example, there's a curfew and uh, that idea that it is a privilege. It's uh, really, I, a lot of us do have a lot of privilege in this world. And I personally believe that all black lives matter. And I'm thinking about that even at the same time as I'm keen to engage in uh, intellectual uh, learning today. And I know that many of you are thinking and living and, and processing and thinking about what this means uh, in the middle of the COVID epidemic, but also for each of our local and national and international contexts. Uh, with that, I uh, will say that my role today is uh, as the host, I will be uh, assisting behind the scenes and uh, helping answer and moderate some of the questions, but really we're here to learn from Walter Epic, Dr. Dr. Walter Epic, who is a pediatric emergency physician and an educator. Um, I think he's internationally renowned for his work in both uh, teaching excellence and research and at Northwestern where he leads the Faculty Development Academy and uh, takes care of sick kids, trains residents and um, really I've always admired and learned from Walter. It's been uh, over a decade since I've gotten to do that closely and um, excited for all of you to get this time with him as well. So I'm confident we're gonna have a fantastic hour together. Walter, I will hand over to you uh, to talk to us about a uh, topic uh, of your passion and that has been influential in my work. So thank you very much and welcome. Well, thank you for that very kind introduction, Damien. And uh, I'm really fortunate to be talking today about a topic that is very near and dear to my heart, which is conversational learning. And I'm gonna call this session, Learning Through Talk, Exploring Synergies Between Simulation-Based and Workplace-Based Learning. Before I launch into it though, I'm very keen to know where you guys are from um, and maybe what your professional background is. And I know that there is a question and answer box. If we could view that, for a moment as a chat box, if you could enter your, um, where you're from, maybe city, country, and your professional background, that would be great. Just to get a, just to get a sense of the, the audience. And so you'll find uh, in the center of your toolbar, which should be in the bottom part of your screen, you'll see the Q&A box. Vancouver, BC, hi Sarah, te nurse teaching in a critical care program. Awesome, thank you so much. New Brunswick, New Jersey, paramedic, thank you. Leslie. Angus, thank you, Canada. Elizabeth Horsley from Brooklyn, thank you. Inside to Simulation is Stanford, thank you, Teresa. Colleen, Australia, welcome. Kathleen, paramedic. Mexico City, anesthesia. Hello, Eli. Susan Barnes, welcome. Colette, how are you? Good to see you again. Bruce from Seattle, respiratory therapist, professor. Vitali, welcome. Michigan. All right, well, thank you. I've got a flavoring of this. I know now they're coming in fast and furious, and I'm having uh, Lon is here. Welcome, Lon. All right. Um, what I'm going to do, thank you for, for sharing those, those uh, introductions. Um, I'm going to forge ahead and just start off by saying that I do have some things I'd like to just disclose and that I do work for CMS and get some salary support that they pay to my institution. Same for the University Hospital in Zurich. Um, I 
teach on courses with PetSim and I'm faculty at the Debriefing Academy. So I'd like to start with a story that really launched my interest in this overarching topic of conversational learning. And I uh, am an emergency physician, as Damien mentioned. And about six or seven years ago, I was on an overnight shift and we had a, a four-year-old child who came into the emergency department who was quite unwell. And this child had a number of uh, underlying health issues and uh, was presenting in a manner that looked like the child might have a sepsis picture. Now, this child was followed very closely by the pediatric surgery program. And also it had, clearly it had multiple abdominal surgeries and had hardware ostomies, G-tubes and these sort of things. As we were beginning the resuscitation of this patient in the ED, I turned to the resident and said, we need the surgery resident to come now. And it was quite remarkable to me that it seemed within a minute that surgery resident was standing behind me. And after we had stabilized the patient and the patient was, who, who did fine, the patient was admitted to the hospital, I was, became quite intrigued by how the resident was able to persuade the surgery resident to come right away. And for those of you in clinical practice, you will know that that's not necessarily a given. And I asked the resident, so what, what did you actually say to the surgeon that, that made them come so quickly? And she said, oh, I just described that we have this four-year-old patient followed very closely by insert name of the surgeon, who's the chair of, of uh, the chief of surgery, pediatric surgery. And I said, we're very concerned the patient is septic. This is how he's presenting. And rather than gather more details, the surgeon said, I'm just going to come down. And that really struck me because a lot of residents struggle with that particular developmental stage. And it really got my brain spinning. And it became quite interesting interesting to me how some would learn those particular skills of being persuasive, conveying urgency, and being convincing on the telephone. So I became interested in talk as a main area of interest. And I, I come from a simulation background, so I'm all about conversational learning. But I took a step back and looked at this at a, at a broader level. And so the main questions for this session today are to first ask ourselves, what is talk? And I'll provide a definition. Why does talk matter for clinical education? And how can simulation and workplace talk inform each other? So first, what is talk? Um, you know, very, very often in um, the health professions education literature, we, we often talk a lot about experiential learning. And in actuality, um, a lot of that is learning by talking. And talk, depending on the literature stream you're looking at, could be referred to as conversation, discourse, dialogue, communication. And really, it, for the purposes here, it's joint social activity that is comprised of the verbal and nonverbal aspects of the talk with its social implications. Now, one of the things that uh, we also know, as I mentioned, this experiential learning piece is that a lot of it is learning by talking. There's so much conversation that's happening in clinical practice and actually so much conversation and so much talking that we actually view this talk as work. Think about all of the, the work that people do in presenting patients to each other, signing out from one team to the next, um, taking nurse report, um, as an example, paramedics arriving in the ED and giving the bullet presentation about what they encountered in the field. All of these aspects of communication are the work of modern healthcare. And one of the things that this has done is this has led to a view of this talk as being a communicative competency and a competency to be mastered. And this is evidenced by, um, at least in, in medicine, in competency frameworks, let's say from CanMeds, which is a Canadian framework or the Accreditation Council on Graduate Medical Education in this country, that view talk as a communicative competency, both in teams and uh, between, between individuals. But that neglects an important aspect of talk, which is that it's a social medium of learning. It's actually the medium in which we learn. And in Talking about it in this way, I like to present a uh, 
sort of view of learning as Anna Safard presented it, which is that there's two metaphors of learning. One is that learning is an acquisition uh, model. You acquire knowledge and store knowledge away. And the other one is a very much a participatory model. You participate in teams while caring for patients and thus learn. And so I very much for my work taking a participatory lens on my work and this social nature is incredibly important. One of the reasons why this is so important is because talk, again, this joint social activity mediates learning and it mediates patient care in team-based healthcare settings. So it is these, these conversations that actually influence how we learn. And I'm gonna unpack that for the rest of this session. And unfortunately, we know from the literature that when communication breaks down, which it often does in healthcare, patient care breaks down, and what I'm gonna to submit to you, learning breaks down. So if we don't communicate effectively, patients are at risk, but I would also argue that learning is suffering as well. Now, fortunately, we know that if you steer the talk of practice, you structure how people interact in place and time, that that has benefits for patients and for learning. Um, and I'm now citing a book chapter that I published uh, several years ago. Uh, it, there, I reviewed the literature on this topic and looked at, for example, interdisciplinary ward rounds, so the types of ward rounds that happen as inpatients. And if you structure those ward rounds effectively by bringing people together in time and space and giving people a, um, a role in the conversation about patient care, you can actually reduce preventable adverse events. So steering the talk reduces the rate of bad things happening to patients. We also know from the surgery literature that if you use checklists, again, you reduce preventable adverse events. Think about the WHO surgical checklist. We also know from handoffs from one team to the next is a high risk time. And if you structure how these handoffs occur and allow for shared understanding, you again can reduce preventable adverse events. Amy Starmer, who's a pediatrician from Boston Children's Hospital, did a lovely series of studies culminating with a New England Journal of Medicine paper looking at how she trained residents in pediatrics at multiple sites to hand off patients more effectively. Again, a powerful way to uh, promote not only patient care, but how you're learning. And of course, we're all here today because simulation is is near and dear to our hearts. And simulation is not only a means to practice skills and gain knowledge, but it's, it's a highly social process. And I will argue that the talk of simulation is a great driver of how we learn. So why does talk matter? Talk matters because it influences how we design curricula. It influences how we develop faculty and how we can support our learners. So one of the things I did in my own research program that, that culminated with my PhD was how does talk contribute to learning and clinical education, which is a pretty broad question. In order to look at this, I looked at talk as a mechanism of learning for practice, meaning from formal educational settings. And how do people learn through talk from practice, which is in the workplace while they're actually caring for patients? And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you an overview of these two big categories of learning through talk, for practice and from practice. And then I'm going to add some additional literature to, um, to, to uh, add some meat to the bones of this, of this topic. Um, by the way, at the very end, you're going to get a, you'll see a QRS code that'll provide a handout to this talk. So never fear, you'll be able to see all the references. And if you're interested, you'll be able to pull the original papers and and have a look. So again, as I said, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at learning through talk for practice, learning through talk from practice, and the examples we're gonna look at is healthcare debriefing, and then telephone talk, going back to this example with the resident I described earlier, and then we'll talk about team reflection. And from these two areas, we're gonna then derive some synergies that can inform how we, how we function as educators and as clinicians. First, healthcare debriefing. So what are debriefings? And I think many of you know that debriefings are nothing more than conversations. 
conversations to make sense of events, to explore uh, aspects that people should continue doing, what they did well, areas of improvement, and also to identify the strategies for future, for future learning. Now, I will say that there's also a whole literature on critical incident debriefing, which is not the focus of my work. I focus on debriefing as a, an educational event, not as a therapeutic uh, event. And I'm raising this issue because in today's day and age, um, that debriefing can have a role in that space as well, although that, I'm not going to really be talking about that at, the, at this time. So the simulation literature uh, and debriefing literature has had historically focused on the process of debriefing or how to debrief, what structure to use, what conversational strategies, and very much uh, overshadowed the what to debrief and which is the content, the topics you would bring up. And one of the things we've realized over time is that one of the things that's incredibly important is this balance between process and content. And that depends on the context. Who are your learners? How much time do you have? What is the, what is the performance domain that you're interested in? Is it, is it um, team-based care? Is it delivering bad news? What, what is the context? Um, and this context is so important Actually, uh, work by Christian Crow, who did a, a lovely interview study looking at experts' uh, practices, and really they apply what he called artistry to their debriefing, which means using context and applying the strategy that fits just at this moment. So thinking about how context plays a role, I collaborated with Adam Chang from Calgary in Canada, and we developed a debriefing model known as PEARLS. And I would refer you to this, to this paper, but at a very uh, high level, PEARLS is about a blended approach to debriefing. We recognize that one size does not fit all, and that what we could actually see, or what we actually did see, is that people are using various educational strategies, even blended within the same debriefing. And our focus here was post-event debriefing, so after a simulation. And the three conversational strategies or educational strategies that people were using primarily in the analysis phase were getting learners to self-assess their own performance. How do you think that went? Plus Delta, as an example. Facilitating focused discussions around a particular topic using any number of strategies, one of which might be advocacy inquiry, circular questions, guided team self-correction, these types of things. And then last but not least, of course, providing learners with information in the form of directive feedback or uh, focused teaching. And the thing that we articulated here was that you needed to adapt the debriefing to the context. And we provided some decision support uh, using some key contextual factors, such as how much time do you have available, um, who are the learners? What is your own skill set? Uh, and these sort of things. Um, and so, this adaptability and context dependency of debriefing is something that we really put a lot of uh, a meat on with this particular piece. Building further here, this is a paper we published in 2015, thinking about how we might structure feedback and debriefing to achieve mastery learning goals. The, fo the focus being on structuring the feedback and debriefing in a particular context. And in this case, we looked at resuscitation education and specifically advanced life support skills. And uh, here, the focus was in the types of debriefings that might be happening embedded within the scenario. So not post-event debriefing, but actually within the debriefing, something that we called micro debriefings um, during these advanced life support scenarios. And in order to study this, we took the educational strategies that uh, Betsy Hunt, who's one of the authors used, as well as Viva Jo Sidal, in papers that had been previously published. And in these previously published papers, they were able to demonstrate the effectiveness of their educational interventions. And in this particular paper, we took a deep dive in describing what exactly it was that they were doing. And Betsy Hunt, uh, has using, is using this approach called rapid cycle deliberate practice, which we really describe in a lot of detail here. 
And Vibhendra Sadal would do other things like giving learners feedback and reflection, reflective moments as the scenario is unfolding. And so these strategies were shown to be quite effective. And actually in the, um, in the original papers, there was not a lot of description as to what they were doing. You know, they, they engaged in uh, structured feedback and debriefing in a supportive environment is what one of the papers said. And yet in this paper here, we unpack exactly the types of things that they were doing. So for example, Vibhadra Sadal, she, in a two hour session, she might run 15 scenarios. They're all very short. The residents who are participating um, would take turns being the team leader and she would stand behind the team leader and sort of give the, the, the team leader some feedback and, and pose some reflective questions that got them to reflect on what they were seeing. So this, this was an example of a highly contextualized uh, approach to feedback and debriefing, specifically for advanced life support skills. Now, the recommendations that we published in, the, in that paper made their way ultimately into these resuscitation education science guidelines from the American Heart Association that were published in 2018. I was very fortunate to be the working group leader for the feedback and debriefing section. And the things that we emphasized here were that in, as it relates to resuscitation education, we need to be very specific about the feedback and debriefing practices, including when it happens, some during, some after, how we do it, and what are the things we're gonna be addressing, specifically related to quality of basic life support and advanced life support maneuvers in addition to team, team uh, aspects. One of the things we additionally highlighted here was the important role of performance data to inform that feedback. So data about the quality of basic life support as an example. Are they pushing too fast or too slow? Too shallow, too deep? Was the time before the, the, the defibrillation too long? Was the pause in, in compressions too long? These types of things. So again, incredibly contextualized. And I think one of the messages here is that these feedback and debriefing conversations need to be very much fit for purpose. So the other big question is what enables these debriefing conversations to happen irrespective of the context? And one of the things that's come through loud and clear is that we need to have a safe container for learning. And this is really foundational work that Jenny, Robert, and Dan uh, have published uh, already six years ago. It's remarkable when we think about it. Thinking about how do you create an environment that is both safe yet challenging for learners to take risks. Building on that, uh, they wrote a commentary about a lovely piece looking at rapport management and how do educators connect with their learners, developing rapport so that you can then ask the tough questions that promotes change and promotes learning. Most recently, last year, Michael Kolbe from Zurich led the charge in writing a piece on managing psychological safety and debriefings, which is truly a balancing act, since it's not enough just to establish psychological safety. You also have to manage it, maintain it, identify threats to it, and then manage those threats and regain psychological safety. So this is an incredibly important component of learning conversations in educational settings. We actually set aside time to create a supportive environment. We're very mindful of it. Further, uh, earlier this year, we published this piece with Adam Chang and colleagues looking at how debriefers develop their skills. And we came up with a conceptual framework based on the Dreyfus Dreyfus model of, of expertise development, namely, beginner, advanced beginner, all the way up through expert. And we, we distilled it down to three key uh, components, namely discovery, growth, and maturity. But you'll notice there's a very distinct focus on what the ex-educator is doing in developing expertise to facilitate these discussions and apply those skills in particular contexts. And I'd like to just build a bridge with you to other types of learning conversations. Here's a piece that we wrote, uh, Walter Tavares, uh, Adam Chang again is on this piece, 
Tim Tennyson, who I've done lots of work with, Chris Walling, who's a feedback expert, and of course, Joan Sargent, who's done uh, a, really a whole career's worth of work looking at facilitated feedback conversations. And one of the, the, the main things that we, we glean from this sort of uh, theoretical piece is that whereas debriefing has always been viewed as a conversation with learning as the goal, that's sort of a guided reflection, if you will, feedback often has been characterized as information about performance. And it's something you tell to learners. And actually, those are the histories of these words, the sort of origins. And very often people think of feedback as something that, that falls under assessment. And whenever you walk up to a learner and say, I'd love to give you some feedback, they turn red in the face and uh, it becomes uncomfortable. And in recent times, recent years, the literature on feedback really is merging and aligning in many ways with, with that of debriefing. These, these terms that were quite distinct are coming down and they're, they're really all learning conversations. And so what I've described up until now has been these guided reflective conversations that very much have an educator driving the process. And what I'd like to do now is turn my attention a little more to the types of conversations that people will have in the workplace and identify some synergies from those. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna transition from debriefing and talk a little bit about telephone talk, which is an area in which I did a number of studies um, to understand what the intrinsic learning potential was of these important conversations. And you might ask why I spent some time looking at this. I spent time looking at telephone conversations because doctors in training spent an inordinate amount of time on the telephone. Somehow for laymen, doc, they think that we as physicians or healthcare workers um, spend all of our time speaking to patients, doing procedures on patients, spending time with patients, when in actuality, where I work in the pediatric ER, and I'm sure this is similar for Damien, a resident physician, a trainee doctor will go and see a patient, take a history, do an exam, and then come out, tell me as the supervising physician about them, and then go get on the phone and call subspecialists to get advice, call to get the patient admitted to the hospital, call to get uh, imaging results or organize investigations, these sort of things. So for, I, I figured this would be an important area to look at. And so what I did is I did a study, which I'm gonna tell you about now, um, that we published last year, um, and we called it Learning the Lingo. And we looked at telephone talk and its influences on clinical education. And I asked the question with my colleagues, how do these work-related telephone conversations contribute to clinical education? And again, if you recall back to the definition of talk, it's this joint social activity. So this social aspect was an incredibly important aspect. Most of the prior work on telephone talk very much looked at telephone talk, telephone conversations as a, a moment of information exchange. And I really looked at it more than just information exchange, but also as a social interaction. So my, the methods I used, were to do uh, in interviews. I did semi 17 in-depth semi-structured interviews with a range of trainees from pediatrics, emergency medicine, internal medicine, orthopedic surgery at various training levels from their first year to their eighth year of training post-medical school. And I used a specific qualitative methodology known as grounded theory, constructivist grounded theory, essentially means that I did some interviews, did some analysis, did some interviews, did some analysis. I looked at the various stories within the, the data and compared them. And then what I did in the latter stages is that based on the model that I had evolving, I selected people from various stages in training or specialties to pose additional questions. And as I've already highlighted, I used what we call a sociocultural lens. So that means I used theoretical frameworks from that, that space and used them to analyze my data and also to derive my interview guide. And I asked them very simply, tell me, who do you talk to on the telephone? Why are you talking to them? Tell me about a recent conversation you had. Um, tell me about a recent conversation that stands out for you. Why does it stand out for you? What challenges do you face? Um, what advice would you give more junior, more junior doctors? And by the way, before I proceed, I'm gonna just 
answer the question that many people uh, pose, which is why did I not use analyzed recorded conversations? And the reason is, is that I was very interested in their motivations and their perceptions about the telephone calls. Certainly it would be worthwhile to analyze recorded conversations. That would be a different methodology and would lead to uh, other answers. So what did we find? We found that there were positive influences on learning based on these telephone conversations, which is not surprising. And what we found in our analysis is that these young doctors experienced what we called productive conversational tensions. Now, I will say the literature before has looked at these tensions as, as a, a negative aspect. And indeed, also in our data, we found them to be unpleasant. But rather than negative, we found them to be productive. And these productive tensions were related to three main areas in our analysis, namely uh, dealing with and managing uh, power differentials, experiencing and dealing with pushback and uncertainty. So pushback, uh, which may be a bit of a jargony term, is essentially um, having a request of someone or proposing something and they, they, they turn it down without due consideration. So it's not just people saying no. It's, it's saying no in a very forceful way that doesn't seem to be open for other people, other perspectives. And by the way, the power differentials is of course, um, you know, generally trainee to supervisor. Um, it could also be uh, other people have something that you need, like they, they have an ICU bed, um, for example. And of course, uncertainty is something we all deal with all the time. But how do you deal with that uncertainty and still come across in a way that is trustworthy? And you might wonder why these productive tensions promoted learning. Well, universally, people describe them as being um, unpleasant. And so in order to avoid future unpleasantness, they modified how they spoke on the phone. So they didn't like pushback, so they changed what they said and how they said it in order to avoid pushback in the future. I'm going to unpack these things a little bit. So just to give you some uh, really big picture representative examples of the power differentials, for example, you don't want to call up your attending, which is the supervising physician, uh, to call them up in the middle of the night and then clearly not have thought about what's going on with a case. It's just disrespectful. And then there's a self-respect aspect of it. I don't want them to think I'm an idiot. Dealing with pushback. In medicine, most of the time when there's a difference of opinion, it's kind of subjective. You pick and choose those battles. You're storing up your ability to push your opinion harder when it really matters. And this particular um, a person in my study was in their eighth year of training, was quite advanced. And uh, I would imagine you all also would recognize this is quite a nuanced way of viewing pushback and battles. Um, rather than thinking you've got to win every battle and get your way every time, with over time you recognize there's nuance to this. And you learn this nuance in the conversations, in dealing with the pushback. Then of course there's uncertainty that happens all, that's present uh, for all of us. And yet for junior doctors, they talk about it a lot. So here, this is from, from a first year doctor. You get a lot of pages from nurses about little things and sometimes you're not sure. I often feel like I have to check with my senior or my more senior doctor. Sometimes I do know the answer and that's great, but sometimes I have to say, you know, I don't know, I'm gonna call you back. So if I look at this from a big picture and create a model, resident who are uh, trainee doctors or fellows who are also more advanced trainee doctors, speak with whomever, their conversation partner, whether it's nurses or supervising doctors. And in those conversations that are happening within a specific patient care context that influences why they're saying what they're saying, they may be getting help and to whom they're saying it, they may be speaking to an ICU doctor, they're experiencing tensions and managing these tensions. I've already highlighted the reasons for them, power differentials, pushback and uncertainty, and the learning revolves around the what you say and how you say it. The what you say and how you say it. So the what you say is the content of the conversation, both the information of it, the medical knowledge, the how to get things done, the collegiality, these sort of things, 
creating a social space. And then of course there's the how you say it or the rhetoric of it. How are you persuasive? How do you make a convincing case? Much like that, that resident who was calling the surgeon who got the surgeon to come right away. So further, uh, some little mini quotes. Many people highlighted that the first substantive sentence is critical, quote, because people won't listen until they know what they're listening for. Junior doctors don't frame, don't provide the one-liner, but over time they learn how important that is. I'll get to why in a moment. Participants also stressed, quote, learning the lingo to, quote, paint a picture by, quote, using buzzwords to convey information and urgency concisely and persuasively. They talked about using the words that are going to convince that person that something needs to happen right now, not in a way that's manipulative, but in a way that just gets the work done. If you're speaking to a surgeon, use the words the surgeon understands. If you're speaking to the ICU doctor, use the words that they understand, etc. By the way, so we've talked a lot about these productive conversational tensions, which was one of the main findings of this study, but please beware, I am not advocating that we should intentionally create tensions. We should not be intentionally creating tensions because that can lead to incivility and disruptive behavior, which has a whole literature base that underscores why these things are not helpful. Incivility and rudeness impact cognitive ability, and just, no one wants disruptive behavior. And a lot of my, my residents talked about incivility and disruptive behavior, which are so unpleasant that they actually just want to get off the telephone. Some conversations are just so unpleasant that they're like, just get me off this telephone right now. Let, well, I'll do whatever you need, goodbye. Versus when, the, the, the conversation partners created a, a nice social space, residents would engage in learning behaviors that were actually quite profound, such as looking at hypotheticals. So for example, one uh, emergency medicine resident had a patient with a, a specific fracture in the pediatric ER and was calling them up and said, you know, by the way, if I was in the community setting and I had a patient with this injury, what would I do if? And so if the conversations are not completely unpleasant, then they'll pose additional questions and manage their own learning window. Building on this, we used the data from these initial interviews to explore further what are the educational needs for these residents. And so we did a reanalysis of these 17 interviews to identify, identify main learning needs. And I'm going to describe this in a moment. So the main findings were that not surprisingly, the Judy doctors need some training. And some of the common challenging situations were calling for advice from a subspecialist or their supervisors, like calling someone up in the middle of the night, or the ER or A&E physician calling the surgeon, as an example. And then very particularly structuring presentations in a way that was succinct, but also conveying urgency. I heard so often from, from my uh, interviewees, they would say, people would not get to the point, and after four minutes, they finally say, I, they give me the things that I needed to know. If they just said that up front, I would have come right away. So this is not, not necessarily surprising. Um, what people describe is that junior doctors often give, quote, rambling presentations in which the severity of the patient's condition gets lost, and then no one's paying attention. Or they, present irrelevant information while paradoxically leaving out critical details. So if you don't really know what was important, you're gonna tell me everything, which maybe I don't care about. I care about the important things. And I think that will resonate for a lot of you on the call when people, irrespective of your profession, when people are telling you things that you don't wanna hear and you're like, just get to the point already. Or this is what I need to know, you've left that out. So our main findings were that there are certain things that help and hinder learning. What helps learning are explicit teaching and feedback practices. Most notably when, when supervising doctors or, consult, or um, 
subspecialists share the why behind their recommendation. They share their thought process, which is really relevant for faculty development. Don't just tell someone to do something, tell them why you want them to do it. Give them the, the rationale for that. I heard that over and over again. I want to hear the thought process. The other big thing is that there are these so-called informal conversational interruptions and questions that happen. So to give you an example, uh, an informal interruption would be something that's happening when, um, let's say the information is not being structured in a way that you want to hear it, or you're not even sure why they're calling you. So let's say you have a surgery uh, a doctor who's getting a phone call from an emergency medicine resident. Hey, I've got an eight-year-old kid who's had three days of abdominal pain, and now there's some vomiting for two days, and today there has been a little bit of loose stool, no fever really, and then they get interrupted with, why are you calling me right now? These, these very specific things are what help them learn because they are, in a way, feedback about how they're doing in the conversation. The other thing, of course, are the, uh, the types of questions that people get. Let's take an example of an infectious disease physician who may be getting a call from a, a, a junior doctor about a patient with prolonged fever. And then the, uh, the infectious disease doctor then asks, so have they had any travel history? Do they have any pets? What's their immunization status? Et cetera, et cetera. And the astute residents, the astute young doctors will recognize that these interruptions and questions actually serve as, quote, disguised feedback. Once the infectious disease doctor asks you these same questions again and again, you realize that, geez, when I have a patient with prolonged fever, then I should be providing this information up front. They're not telling you, hey, you need to be telling me this, but if you're astute, that you learn that that's something that you need to be presenting. So the, the feedback is disguised. So here's a quote. Even if they're, meaning the supervising doctors or the subspecialists, even if they're not specifically giving you feedback, you can tell it if you, they have all the information that they want or if you've left out some things, you get better at unpacking the disguised feedback on the other end of the phone. So something that they're learning through the conversations is how to gauge how they're doing and getting feedback. So when we think about this notion of disguised feedback, we realize that this has some implications in how we use it in simulation. And I like to present like a new paradigm of simulation for you. Very classically, simulation is about learning how to perform, which is preparing learners for their clinical practice. But I would like to submit to you that we can also use simulation to prepare learners to learn from their clinical practice. So let me juxtapose these two. I could teach young doctors to use a structured approach to calling a consult, and there's lots of frameworks out there, the 5C model, et cetera. Or I can sensitize learners to what's gonna happen. You're gonna get interrupted. People are gonna pose questions. And when you're getting interrupted, you're not presenting the information in a way that they're used to hearing it. Maybe you haven't framed it properly. You need to rethink how you approach that. And so one of the things I'm gonna recommend for you is to integrate telephone talk into existing uh, simulations. I think there's a lot of value, value in that. And actually, perhaps even making a curriculum that focuses solely on the telephone talk, which is something I'm working on actively right here at my own institution. I'd like to just touch on this notion of sensitizing learners to this disguised feedback and the, and the feedback process. And I'd like to point you to some direction, into a direction of some amazing new work that has come to my attention recently. And that is the literature around feedback literacy. And Carles and Bao talked about feedback literacy as being the understandings, capacities, and dispositions needed to make sense of information and use it to enhance worker learning strategies. So in contrast to the work on debriefing that I presented earlier, which is very much about how do I approach it as an expert educator, as a debriefing facilitator, what do I need to be doing? The feedback literacy literature very much looks at it from a learner-centered perspective. And here's some work by Liz Malloy uh, and colleagues from, uh, Liz is from Melbourne in Australia, and quite innovative work, thinking about how, 
how do learners approach feedback processes? And people who are feedback literate, just to give you some things, there's a whole framework in this paper, I would encourage you to have a, gl a, a glance at that, is a commitment to improvement, realizing that feedback is an active process for learners, that they need to integrate this feedback and try it on for size. Um, so I'd have a look at this, and I think this, this notion of helping people understand to read the feedback that's in their environment, what information they're gonna be getting, really dovetails beautifully into in the notion of sensitizing people to the disguised feedback that they're gonna be getting. For the remainder of the talk, I'm gonna shift gears and talk about team reflection. And before I launch into details about team reflection, I'm gonna take a step back and I'm gonna, point to you in the direction of a paper from Jenny Weller who talks about tribalism in healthcare and um, how people view themselves as part of one group or the other, either um, emergency medicine and ICU or um, physician and nurse or medical student and uh, junior doctor or junior doctor and consultant or attending physician. We, we sort of identify with particular groups, and often it leads to an us versus them thinking. So we're not on the same page, which is actually not what teams are about. Teams are about having a shared vision, a shared purpose, shared understanding. And unfortunately, this sort of us versus them thinking does have concrete patient safety risks, which the literature uh, makes clear. And I think one of the aspects that we've often heard is that we need to teach people to use structured communication practices. Um, such as SBAR, or as it's known in some places as ISBAR, right? Situation, background, assessment, recommendation. And I think these efforts are great. And I think that SBAR is not enough. Again, SBAR is not enough. They are great strategies that structure the talk to promote information exchange, but there's so more to it. So if I were to envision a future or envision the present, I would like us to think how we can put our hands in together and work better together. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about some specific conversational strategies that can promote team inclusiveness. And these are things that you can start doing right as soon as we get off this webinar. And again, it's about moving from them to us. And the things that put the pieces together are number one, inclusive leadership, inclusive leader language, and then team reflection, which is the topic that I'm gonna take a deeper dive into. But first, inclusive leadership. Inclusive leadership is the explicit invitation of input and appreciating other people's contributions. And Nempard and Edmondson were able to show that if you are explicit about saying, hey, listen, I need to hear from you, and thank you for that suggestion, people are more likely to speak up. And as we all know, we need people to speak up, to, to be our eyes and ears, to share their concerns, because no one can do it by themselves. Related to that is, this idea of inclusive leader language. And Mona Weiss and colleagues, including Amiche Elekorbe from Zurich, looked at inclusive leader language, specifically related to making explicit invitations for outgroup members, and that an outgroup member would be, I as a physician explicitly invite someone who's a nurse, who's not in my same group for, for uh, input, or if I'm in the ER and I have a, uh, critical care doctor there that I might be explicitly inviting them. Hey, what do you, what do you guys, what do you think here? Rather than waiting for them to speak up. This is part of where SBAR is not enough. I can't wait for someone to use SBAR on me. I need to invite them for their input. And then the other thing that they found is that if you, for in-group members, you use implicit language like we, us, our, that that would be incredibly powerful in promoting speaking up. So both of these notions, and they, just, they demonstrated this in a simulation study, explicitly inviting people and using implicit language promoted speaking up behaviors and information sharing. Now to team reflection. 
a lot of this work uh, is work that, I, that has been led by Jan Schmutz, who is a psychologist and friend from Zurich, Switzerland. And we looked at this idea of team reflection, or really in the literature, it's called team reflexivity. And we, we thought about how it was in, originally conceived. And what we'd like to do is uh, think about this as reflection after an event. And I became very interested in this when I was chatting with Jan some years ago, because reflecting on something after it happens or post action is a debriefing, which I've already spent a lot of time talking about. And so what Jan and I did is we looked at the moments of reflection that could occur surrounding and during patient care episodes. So here in the image, you see a patient on a stretcher. That's the patient care episode. And you see the dotted line before that, that's before the action during the action and after the action. So before the patient care episode, you can huddle and brief. Think about getting an, uh, a call to say, we have a trauma patient coming, we're 10 minutes out with someone who has uh, fallen from uh, a, a tree and has, you know, has altered mental status. The team can huddle and reflect on what they need beforehand. Then there's the reflection that can happen in the heat of the moment, during. That is not lengthy. It's not like a full debriefing. It's brief. It can involve processes such as recapping, summarizing, and the ever important inviting input that I just talked about. And the goal of the, all of these reflective processes, whether it's before, during, or after, is to create a shared mental model and to help teams adapt to either current or future situations. Now, we specifically looked in an empiric study at reflecting in the moment, in the heat of the moment, this recapping, summarizing, and inviting input. And this looks like, hey guys, so I'm just gonna summarize. We have a 10-year-old uh, a child who has a history of um, malignancy and who's now coming in with fever, neutropenia, and is hypotensive and in shock. We've done these three things. This is the response we've got. Um, and we're, we're, we're not where we need to be. We're still hypotensive. I'm wondering, what do, you what do you guys think? What might we be missing? What else could be going on? What other suggestions do you have? And I know that in my own clinical practice, I've really taken a lot of this to heart and I know I, I see Ann Mullen on the call. She's a, a critical care nurse. And I certainly have gotten in the habit of in situate critical situations, turning to someone like Ann and saying, Ann, anything on your mind right now? Anything I might be missing? So making very explicit invitations, even calling on people by name. What we found in our study that especially in large teams, this led to improved clinical performance. Um, we haven't yet gotten to the point to show that this actually impacts patient outcomes, but teams perform better. And I would encourage you to have a look. We published this in the Journal of Organizational Behavior two years ago. Um, quite uh, powerful stuff. So I'd like to put the pieces together now and think about the impacts of this work. And what I'd like to put out there for you is that even little things that we change and how we speak can have profound impacts on your team members, and potentially on patients too. How we structure our conversations, the words we choose, the timing of them, inviting input, these sort of things. And one of the, the goals we had at the beginning was to identify synergies for our learning conversations, whether they're occurring in educational environments or whether they're occurring in the workplace, embedded within actual patient care episodes, whether on the phone or team reflection. And again, team reflection is creating shared understandings, which shared understandings also is a way of thinking about learning from each other. So the first synergy is that context is incredibly important. One size does not fit all. And that we need to be quite adaptive to this context. And this is really what adaptive expertise is all about. We need to frame conversations. This is something that we do in, in simulation often, and we learned from the, my studies that giving people a one-liner, telling them what the issue is, hey, I'm calling you with a patient who I think needs to be admitted to the hospital for this. Let me give you some background. 
the framing is incredibly important. And that both types of conversations have process elements that are important and content elements. We also saw that psychological safety plays a role, both creating psychological safety and avoiding disruptive and, and destructive tensions. And that structures and strategies to these conversations are important. I've highlighted that in each of these, the relationships and the rapport are incredibly, incredibly important. And that learning conversations have an incredibly social uh, aspect to them. I've talked about the value of productive tensions on the telephone and in clinical practice potentially as drivers to change. I don't know to what extent we've, we've uh, explored that in debriefings. Somehow we often have this impression that we want everyone to be happy at the end of the debriefing. And yet I'm wondering about that. I'm wondering if there's some productive degree of tension. Again, we're not in trying to intentionally create tension, but is there some degree of tension that's productive? I think we need to be not only thinking about feedback as something that is done onto learners, but learners need to actually be able to reflect on how, the, how they will process the feedback, how, what the feedback will look like, that it's about improvement, that they are active constructors of meaning from the feedback. And simulation can play an important role both to help people prepare for their clinical work, but we can also use simulation to help people learn in their workplaces. And that for both of these areas of conversation, the train of thought, the why is incredibly important, both sharing it and eliciting it from our learners. So in summary, I'd just like to say that talk is more than just a competency, it's a, it drives learning. And I would like to thank at this juncture my research collaborators, Pim Tunison, uh, Tim Dornan, and Jan Yost, who, with whom I would not have done the PhD, of course, Adam Chang, Jan Schmutz, and Michaela, my colleagues at KidStar, which is our SIM program at Lurie Children's, and my colleagues in the Department of Medical Education, and of course, my uh, friends and colleagues at the Center for Medical Simulation, Jenny Rudolph, uh, Dan Raymer, uh, Robert Simon, Damian, Mary Fay, Kate Morse, um, Janice Palaganis, uh, and all. So thank you so much. If you'd like a handout to the session, please um, point your phone at the QRS code. And I realize there's not a lot of time left. Um, I would be happy to, to take any questions in the final minutes we have. And I'm also happy to stay on for a little bit if, if that works for people. So thank you so much. And thank you, Walter. Uh, just a brilliant presentation. I introduced you as a teacher and educator. And, and for me, uh, this hour you've shown, uh, I'm seeing things that I thought were invisible before that's in my definition and you're inspiring. So to, to those well, two criteria, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, there's a question in the, in the Q&A from Leslie Barta She's, uh, that you can read there, but I'll read for the audience. So, and, um, and then I think that we would likely wrap up within a couple of minutes. So do you suppose adding this matter of learning to talk to the curriculum earlier provides a stress inoculation to the rising clinician? Well, I mean, I, I, there's so much within your question, Leslie, and I really appreciate it. Uh, I, I think, letting people know this important role and sharing with them some, some, some aspects of how they will learn through conversation will contribute to their feedback literacy. I can tell you right now is as a response to this, this COVID pandemic, I've been doing a virtual medical education elective with some medical students to bridge the gap until they're allowed to go back to the wards. And I will say that, uh, that for them, learning about feedback processes has been eye-opening. And um, I think we should let people know earlier uh, and uh, about how these processes work and also to develop faculty. I mean, that's one of the main things I do in my job. Um, so I think, I mean, is it a form of stress inoculation? That's, that's something I'll need to grapple with. Um, but letting them know that, hey, this is what's gonna happen. People have a good intention when they're posing lots of questions. This is what it means and this is how it can help you learn. Um, and Mabel, always good seeing you, of course, and thank you for your very, very uh, lovely comment. So we hope that you 
uh, also appreciated and got as much as I did uh, out of today's talk, no pun intended, and um, hope that you consider joining next week or in other weeks. And Walter, I ask you to advance for us. Um, next week, Chris Rusin uh, and Jenny Rudolph are leading a panel. They're hosting uh, Laura Rock and Lon Setnick. They're having a conversation about how to build and um, your organization after the pandemic. And uh, I'm sure it's gonna be quite lively. And Mary and I, the rest of the team at CMS, uh, we'd like to continue partnering with you and remain available. So whether it's through our online webinars and courses, as well as uh, in Boston and internationally, when we get back to that, uh, we'd be happy to connect with you and uh, also tailor something in the meantime. So don't be uh, shy, reach out to us and keep on coming to our weekly webinars. Thank you very much and have a great and safe day. Walter, I thank you. Say, you. You can have the last word for sure. Yes, I will say uh, um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you for your questions. Um, to Eli, the, the QR code is not working. I would say that that uh, the handout will be available when it's posted to, uh, to the CMS website, number one. And number two, I believe there's going to be uh, an emailing that's going out to attendees of this meeting, and they're going to attach it there. And Teresa, I love your suggestion. I think intern boot camp is the perfect place to, to discuss this. Thank you Very all well. so much. And thank you to, to Damian and, uh, and Tony Denzel, who's in the background, and Ann Mullen as well. Thank you.